Shana Haba the Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back to Theology in Perspective. I'm Daniel Woodhead, and I'm blessed that you could join us again today. As you know, we are in the book of Revelation, and it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, or the unveiling of him the way he is now. Now, he's told the Apostle John to write the things that he has seen, the things which are and the things which will be. And we are in the section of the things which are. And that's the letters to the seven churches. Now we've looked at four of those churches and we're going to look at several more today. I want to start with the church of Sardis. And that's the church of the Reformation representing the period in church history about 1517 A.D. to 1648. And I'm going to read from Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. And thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, <coughs> and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will blot out his name from out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The destination of the fifth letter in verse 1 is Sardis, <coughs> excuse me, which means those escaping or the remnant. Now in this historical prophetic interpretation that we're looking at here, it represents the Church of the Reformation. And that began in 1517 with Martin Luther posting his 95 Thesis. And it ended in 1648 with the signing of the Peace of West Westphalia. Now, verse 1b, there's a description of Jesus that's taken from Revelation 1, 4, 16, and 20. And it's, a, it's a reference to the seven spirits of God as over against the church without any spirit. Now, verse 1c is the condemnation. They have a name that lives, but actually they're dead. Now, this is a valid description of the Church of the Reformation as it developed specifically in the later stages. They had a name that lived. Now, the Reformation resulted in a lot of good doctrinal correction and some good creeds. The Reformation corrected much of the doctrines that were promulgated by the Roman Catholic Church that we saw in our last session. They had good creeds and solid biblical doctrine. Nevertheless, they were dead. There was no spiritual vitality. And they became dead because they failed to rectify one basic problem that they took when they broke away from Rome because they became state churches. The church continued to be merged with the state. In Germany and Scandinavia, the Lutheran church became the state church. In England, it was the Anglican Church, or the Church of England. In Scotland, it was the Presbyterian Church. And in one part of Switzerland, the Calvinist or the Reformed Church, and in another part is the Zwinglian Church. Now, the Reformation failed to correct the problem of church and state unity. Therefore, became dead. It became dead. It was a dead church. And what corrupted Pergamum also corrupted Sardis. 
because of the existence of state churches, children that were born in a given locality were simply baptized and by this means became members of the church. Personal faith had little or nothing to do with becoming a member of the church. In a matter of time, the greater part of the church was composed of unregenerate members. And the churches, they had these good solid creeds, except that they were still bound to what I call replacement theology, meaning that the church has replaced the nation Israel, which is not true. And so it appeared as though they were living churches, but they were dead. There was no spiritual life because of the lack of personal faith, and a great part of each church was just composed of unbelievers. Even to this day, there are state churches in Europe that have good doctrinal creeds, but they're composed of people that are spiritually dead and don't believe any of these things. They've never confessed faith. So they may have the Bible, and maybe they have some good creeds, but if they just mouth them and don't really believe them, it's useless. So there's an exhortation that's found in verses 2 and 3. In verse 2, they're exhorted to resurrect that which is about to die. That is to go back to spiritual life as well as good doctrinal creeds. Spiritual life is impossible without good doctrine. But good doctrine without spiritual life is dead. It's meaningless. So both are necessary. Now in verse 3, the point is made that deadness will result in Jesus coming unexpectedly. A church with a spiritual life is not going to be surprised when the Lord returns for his church. Because you know good doctrine and you know what's coming and you know what the Bible teaches. A church that is dead is going to be caught unawares because they're not going to be expecting the Lord Jesus. And his unbelievers they'll be left behind. In verse 4, there is a commendation to those escaping. Their garments are undefiled and white. So these, they've exercised faith, they do have spiritual life, and they've overcome the deadness of the church. Then there's a promise in verses 5 to 6, and it's, and it's threefold here. First, they will have white garments. And the symbol used there is just explain in different parts of Revelation, uh, it is explained. For example, 7.14 says, And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So white are a symbol of salvation. Uh, the first promise to those escaping is salvation because for them, good doctrine is not dead but alive in Jesus. A second promise is that their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Uh, this promise secures their salvation. And then third, Jesus will confess the name of the believer before the angels. Now, these seven churches all descended into apostasy throughout all church history. He just did. I'm going to put a chart up on the overhead here that shows you how the, each one of them descended from good doctrine to poor doctrine and degrees of corruption just got worse and worse and worse, except for Philadelphia. Philadelphia stayed pretty high, and we'll look at that in a few moments. Now, I want to talk about a concept here that is important for us to understand. Sin is in this world. Corruption is in this world, and a church has to fight it, and fight it, and fight it. Because there are so many people that are trying to corrupt the local churches, to corrupt the doctrine, to turn them into man-centered environments instead of God-centered, God-teaching environments. You know, each time you see the word preach, 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 or words, <laughs> in the New Testament, the meaning, going back into the Greek there, is more aligned with teach, teach, teach. God wants us to know. Now this is what the next church did, the Church of Philadelphia. And this represents the Church of the Great Missionary Movement from 1648 to approximately 1900. Now I'm going to read from Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and have kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. And do I, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this is a very powerful message to a pure church. Now the destination is the Church of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. And in the historic prophetic interpretation that we're emphasizing here, it's a fitting symbol of the church during the missionary movement from about 1700 to 1900. That was the period of the great missionary names like Hudson Taylor and Adoram Judson and William Carey and Stanley Livingstone and Amy Carmichael and many, many others. The description of Jesus in verse 7b is taken from Revelation 1.18, picturing him as the one with the authority to open and close doors. This is the second church for which there's no condemnation. Just like Smyrna, Jesus finds nothing against this church and he's satisfied with it. The commendation is found in verse 8. They are commended for making use of the open door. It is Jesus himself who opened the door, and the Philadelphians were faithful in making use of the open door. Now, during the period of the 1700-1900, there was virtually no place where a missionary could not go. Every place was open to them. Today, more and more countries are closing their doors to missionaries. But during those two centuries, there were virtually no limitations, and this church took advantage of it. They had little power. It was a minority supporting those missionaries, yet the little power was used to accomplish great things. And they're commended for it. And there's a promise it's found in verses 9 to 10 and 12 and 13, and it's fourfold. First, verse 9, they're promised fruit from those who claim to be Jews, or the people of God, and are not. Now, you know, it's still the period described by Hosea, Verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 to 9, and chapter 2, verses 23, when, when Israel is on the sideline of God's program and considered to be not my people, lo ami, lo ami. But in the future, they will again become my people, become my people, ami, ami. 1, Hosea 1, 10 to 2, 1, and three, five. And it's interesting to note that the that, that during this time Jewish missions came into its own. Near the end of this time, the Zionists were coming back to the land Israel, referred to as Eretz Israel. And it was also at this time that the Lord Jesus declared the beginning of the end times was starting, and that's nation rising against nation. Now, by 1900, some 250,000 Jews became believers in Jewish missions. First began in Germany, took root in England, and it finally came to fruition in the United States. But it was over a time when the natural branches were regrafted into their own olive tree, from Romans 9, 10, and 11. However, 
it's more likely that this verse deals more literally with those who claim to be Jews, but, but they're not. And this is also the period that saw the rise of cults such as Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, and other Seventh-day Adventists. I want to spend a great deal of time with uh, the Church of Laodicea, because this is the Church of the Apostasy. This is the Church that was going to run all the way to the end, and um, it runs from AD 19, actually a little bit longer than AD 19. Uh, the Apostasy started a little before then, and the latter days of the end times started around 1914 or 1913. Uh, but this is from Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. And uh, I'll read this, and then we'll start talking about it. And there will be two more sessions when we talk about this. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou might see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this is a powerful letter, and this is a letter to a very, very apostate group. And in the historic view, that's the era that we're living in now, the destination of the letter in verse 14a is Laodicea, and it means people ruling. Now this is in direct contrast to God ruling in a church, because it's ruled entirely by men because the Holy Spirit is not there doing his ministry of guiding and leading and teaching and illuminating. The description of Jesus in 14b is taken from Revelation 1, 4, 6, and 7, and he's described as the faithful and true witness, whereas this church is neither faithful nor true to the Word of God. In verses 15 and 16, they're characterized by Luke warmness. The distinction between hot, cold, and lukewarm is determined by the overall context. The hot are the truly saved believers. The cold are those that do not believe and they don't even claim to be believers. The lukewarm are those that claim to believe in Jesus but are not truly regenerate believers. They don't really believe. So apostasy it can be defined as a departure from the truth that one professed to have. It doesn't mean that they actually ever possess the truth. Seldom do apostates ever possess the truth. Rather, it's just a departure from the truth that they said they had. They had some affiliation with a particular church. Maybe they went to a Methodist church, so as far as they're concerned, they're in. They're part of it. Or... Or maybe they're part of some other denomination and they and they said something when they were eight or nine years old that assured them. Or maybe they were told that because they were sprinkled with baptism of some sort when they were six months old that they're part of the church. 
That's not true. That's not true. The New Testament clearly predicts at least two passages that there would be an apostasy in the later days. The first one is found in 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to read for you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now the second passage is in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. And that passage reads, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the prophetic word here says that there's going to be a falling away in the last days. That's a vivid description of this Laodicean church. Now there's three other New, passage, uh, New Testament passages that describe the characteristic of the apostasy. I'm going to read from the same passage again, except I'm going to continue with it, 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. So the source of the apostasy is demons, and they they just have essentially given in to these seducing spirits that are preaching a system of doctrine that's outside of God's word, and it's from the demons. So they're speaking lies through hypocrisy, and their consciences have become insensitive. They don't work. They're seared. It's like the Holy Spirit is not working through them because they have not accepted him. Second passage is found in 2 Timothy, and it's 2 Timothy 3, 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You know, in verses 1 to 4, there's a, there's a description of the general character of the world in the last days, and it can hardly be denied that these elements are true today. Verse 5 centers on the religious front, and the last days are going to be characterized by men having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So apostate ministers, maybe they're retaining clerical garb or the church title of, of being a man of God, uh, maybe they have some form of godliness. Uh, they're nice people, but they're denying the power thereof, and they deny the true power of godliness. They claim trust in God, but they're actually trusting in worldly methodologies. Now, the third passage is found in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 22. Now, this is a very long passage, and I'm going to read this for you because it's helpful to know what the Apostle Peter's attitude is about this, about this apostasy. What does he think about these people? 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 22. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, 
to be reserved under judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous, they are self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing a accusation against them before the Lord, but these natural brutes, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. <coughs> Excuse me and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, of whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned again to its own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now you read through this passage, and you don't see Peter displaying any love or tolerance towards his apostates. The Bible, and particularly the Lord Jesus, do not display any toleration towards apostasy, and they castigate it very severely as these verses clearly show. Matter of fact, in the 11th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, God is showing Ezekiel specific people that are the leaders of the apostasy. It's appropriate to call out the names of the people that are teaching false doctrine. Now, Peter also tells us what the mark of an apostate is. They teach destructive denials. Now, I'm going to close for there for today, and we will pick this up in our next session. As I said, uh, we're going to be in the Church of Laodicea for a while because there's much to talk about here in this apostasy. Beloved, if you do not know the Lord Jesus, I would pray that he will make himself known to you through these teachings and others. If you have accepted that the Lord Jesus died, went into the ground, three days later he rose from the dead, and if you truly believe that historic fact, then you are a born-again believer because God's Spirit will enter you. And we have a 
piece of literature to send you if you email us or call us, the number on the screen or the email address, or just listen to the announcer after this section and he will give you that number and address. You won't be followed up with, we won't bother you, we just want you to have a little booklet about the overall plan of God and your new life as a born-again believer. God bless you, and I look forward to talking to you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877-706-2479. That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. Take us there, take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem.